I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. We've all seen the rumble strips on the side of the road. We all know what they're there for. When we fall asleep or when we're going too fast, they let us know we're straying into an area that's off limits, an area that's dangerous. They let us know that we're leaving the place we're supposed to be. We know what they're there for, but we don't really pay attention to them until we're already going off course. What if, like the road, God was placing rumble strips in our lives, warnings to wake us up or set us back on course when we start to stray, guides to direct and protect our lives? rumble strips. By alerting us before disaster happens, they can minimize the damage and keep us in the safety zone. Have you ever noticed that all the things that you dreaded as a kid are the things that you love now? Have you ever noticed that some of the things that were punishments back when you were a kid are things that are your greatest treasures as an adult? Midday naps, Sleeping in, sleep in general, something that you didn't like as a kid, but now you love vegetables. It's tough to get kids to eat vegetables sometimes. And now you're at this farmer's market looking at zucchini, like salivating, <laughs> spending lots of money on tomatoes and stuff. Um, while, while you're there, bread. Kids will eat all around bread. They'll eat everything but it and just leave bread. When's the last time you heard a little kid come up and say, I got a hankering for some sourdough. I would love some rye bread. It's just, no, silence. How about that? Just quiet. Some of you are like, I don't even know what that is anymore. <laughs> then there are things like hygiene. You hated that as a kid. You're like, well, I don't know. My daughter's pretty clean. Well, if your son was in my cabin at Camp Allendale, I got bad news for you. <laughs> what about when plans get canceled? As a kid, it ruins your day when plans get canceled. As an adult, you're like, don't I have to leave the house. <laughs> Don't have to get dressed. Perfect. Great. Getting socks for your birthday or Christmas. That's a bad move for a kid. As an adult, give me all the socks. That sounds great. Here's a big one. Um, when someone mistakes your age as younger than you actually are, you could ruin a six-year-old's day. My daughter will swiftly correct you if you say she's five years old. If you told me, if you thought I was five years younger than I am, I'm going to let you walk around with that lie for a while. You'd be, you'd be just fine with it. You'll ne you'd never correct them. Your day was just made. You, you thought I was younger than I am. And finally, the age-old punishment, it's timeout. Who would love a timeout right now? <laughs> Put me in timeout and throw away the key. It's devastating when you're a kid, but as an adult, man, timeout would be great. I had a timeout a while back, and it was magical. Let me explain. Several years ago, I was at a men's retreat with my, with my church in Ohio. It was a couple hundred dudes, all different ages, all different backgrounds. We went to this extremely remote farm in Ohio, huge place. It was transformational for my faith. But I remember one exercise that stood out the most back when I think of that experience. The pastor told us, hey, go out somewhere on this 700-ish acre piece. Just be alone. I want you to go somewhere where you can't see anybody else. Don't bring anything with you, no cell phone, nothing. He said, just go be alone for an hour. That was time out for adults. 
And I loved it. No instructions, not even any scripture to read, no discussion or reflection questions for you to look at, just be. And I remember sitting up against a tree somewhere out there and thinking, wow, this is so unusual. This is so foreign. And then I fell asleep. (laughs) When we all gathered back up later at the campsite, the pastor pointed to these different places in Scripture where Jesus went off to be alone. He explained how solitude is an important thing, and it's good for us. It's a spiritual discipline that most of us just ignore. That message that day just had a profound impact on me because I realized I'm hardly ever alone. I realized I'm always with people, and I would prefer it that way mostly. That's, that's what I like. That's how I like my life to be. But to try to keep this rhythm, to keep time out alive in my life for the last couple of years and this year, um, I've been taking this solo hunting trip. So I go a few hours away by myself for four and a half days. And I know what you're thinking, man, your wife must be awesome. And <laughs> you would be correct. I get an Airbnb, I wake up, ridiculous hour, I go way deep into these, into this public land woods, I'm there all day, I come back, go back to the empty Airbnb, no cell phone service really, I don't see anybody or talk to anybody for about four straight days. Have you ever gone four days without speaking to another human? It's wild, it's, it's a, it's an interesting experience, it's hard to describe. I miss my wife and my kids so much, but man, when I get back from this trip of just being alone, of being in time out, I just have this heightened sense of gratitude. I do. I feel refreshed like I never have before. I want to encourage you. If you need a time out, I want to tell you to go take a time out in your life. It's valuable. Another thing that I end up at the end of this trip is exhausted, just tired, just totally spent. I remember last year when I was done, packed my truck up and heading back home, I didn't get very far along the trip, and I just, I hear that noise. And I'm like, oh, I got to get this thing back on track. All right, pay attention. Let's go. And then just a few miles later, down the road. All right, this is getting unsafe now. So I had to pull off on the next exit and I rolled my windows down a little bit and turned my truck off. And before I passed out, I just, I called my wife and I said, hey, I'm at like a Huck's gas station outside Washington, Indiana. Just in case I go missing, I want you to know. (laughs) This is the last place I was. We're in the middle of a series called Rumble Strips, and I'm thankful for the Rumble Strips. They keep you awake. They wake us up. The definition we've been using in this series is an advanced indication of impending devastation. A Rumble Strip is an advanced indication of impending devastation. They're a swift warning that, hey, you're heading in the wrong direction. And this isn't hyperbole, but Rumble Strips can save your life. They can save your life your life. Several states' DOTs have done studies on the effectiveness of rumble strips on the roads, and it's been estimated that up to 51% fatalities have been prevented from this. That there would be half, that, that we have half as many motorists who die on the roads because of the effectiveness of rumble strips. They help people make it to their destination. When you run over them, they're both audible and tactile. They make that horrible noise and they're tactile in that you can feel them. It's like the world's worst massage. You just want to get right back on the road. You can hear them and feel them. This morning, we're going to focus on a familiar passage from the Gospel of Matthew. In this parable, Jesus is describing the kingdom of God. We recently completed our series on the kingdom of God. Josh actually used this same passage in one of the messages, and we learned so much from that. One of the things we learned was when is the kingdom of God? Like where? It's, it's right here, and it's right now. We are participants in it every day. Uh, Yes, his kingdom rule will will be forever, but it doesn't start somewhere off way in the future. We're living in it right here. So in this parable, Jesus is, is explaining more about God's kingdom and more specifically what our role is in it. So check this out, Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. Again, Jesus says, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. And we all know God is with us, okay? We know that. The the Great Commission, what he said before he ascended into heaven, uh, at the end he says, surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Okay, God is with us. But Jesus in his physical body is not here. Now someday he will return in glory and judgment. We just don't know when that's gonna be. We don't even know how much longer we have in our own finite bodies here on earth. But what we do know is that Jesus will return. And in the meantime, he has entrusted us, entrusted us with wealth. 
this word just jumps out to me. What does entrusted mean? It's not a word that we use a ton anymore, but it's significant. To entrust something is, is not the same as just to give somebody something. You give somebody something, you're saying, hey, this is your property now. I don't care what you do with it. You own this. You have full say in everything here. This is yours. When you were a first-time guest here at Victory, and uh, maybe uh, in the last few years, you, you got a free t-shirt. We just gave that to you. And actually, this is the time. There are some shy people in here. You were here your first time, and now you're too scared because you didn't get your t-shirt. I'm inviting you now. Go get your shirt, okay? We have a free shirt for you there at the connection desk. When we give you that shirt, though, it's 100% yours. We don't check back on what you did with it. You could wear that shirt every day, although I wouldn't advise it, or you could wash your baseboards with it. It's just your shirt, and, and that's different. However, when you entrust something to somebody, for example, when you give your tithe or you, you drop off your kid for victory preschool or victory sports, dropping them off to soccer practice, that's different, right? That is much different. You're not, what you're giving is not ours. You, you're giving it and then you're expecting that the church puts it to good use, that we will do something with it. Your student, when you drop off your student, you want her to learn something. You want her to improve, to gain some knowledge or your athlete. You want them to develop skills. You expect something different that they'll come back a little bit better. Entrusting is much more than just giving. The word Jesus uses is entrust. The master entrusts his wealth to the servant. Verse 15 says, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another servant two bags, to another one one, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. I don't want to take too much from this verse than should be, but there's a few things that, that really jump out. First off, everybody's given something. Do you see that? There are three servants here that this master has. None of them get zero. They've all been given and trusted some level of wealth. Nobody left out. Number two, and if I was a shouting person, I would shout this, but what is the currency? What is the currency that this master is giving? Gold. Bags of gold. I don't know how inflation works for 2,000 years later, but I've, I'm pretty sure gold was a timeless element is, that people have always valued tremendously. I looked at how much gold costs now, and what I read was $1,700 an ounce. So if you've got gold, you've got wealth. You got value. Would, would a bag of gold change your life? It would flip my world upside down. And this master gave gold to all of his servants. And finally, how much did he give? We get that from verse 15. According to his ability. Not everybody got the same, but this master who knew each one of these servants knew exactly the right amount to give to each one of them. He knew exactly what they could handle, the different capacity they have. You might think it's scandalous for any master to give any amount of gold to the servant. Yes, we have a different kind of master here who is giving gold just according to each one of his servant's capabilities. Verse 16 says that the man who had received five bags of gold, he went at once. That's important. He went straight away. He didn't waste any time. He put his money to work and he gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off. He dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. So the first two servants, they went to work right away. They leveraged this wealth that had been entrusted to them and they doubled it. They doubled their treasure. The third one did what? Well, he just tucked it away. He just hit it. I don't want to do anything crazy. I want to make sure that this is in the same condition as when it was given to me. I don't want anything to happen to it. So he just, he just hid it away until his master returned. And the master, it says, returned and settled accounts. This is not words you use when you're giving somebody a gift. You don't a year later show up and settle accounts. Imagine that. You show up to Christmas this year and your uncle, he gave you a book last year. Hey, did you read that book? That self-help book that I gave you that everybody's reading that you're probably not going to like. Did you read that book? I would love a summary on it. Tell me, uh, how many people did you recommend the book to? That's, that's settling accounts. That's, that's not how people give gifts. Or maybe, maybe your aunt, she gave you a, a case of golf balls. She said, here you go. I'm entrusting these to you. And next year, she's like, what happened to those golf balls, by the way? Are they still in good condition? You didn't hit any of them in the water or the woods, did you? And if it was my aunt, I would say, I got some bad news for you. <laughs> Entrusting is different 
than giving. The master didn't just give them gifts. He entrusted immense wealth with them. And when he returns, he wants to hear about what happened with it. So here's what happens. We're going to look at the rest of the parable. It's a, about 10 verses of scripture here, so follow closely. It says, the man who had received five bags of gold, he brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two bags of gold, he also came up and he said, Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold and see, I've gained two more. His master replied and he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, investing where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, embrace yourself. He said, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed? Where do you get that? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have at least received back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has been given more, they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw, and this is tough, that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sounds extreme, doesn't it? That's not comfortable to read right there. I don't know how you feel when you hear this story, but my first reaction is I feel sympathy for that last servant who had one bag. I want to argue for him. Like, he didn't lose it. He didn't go to the casino and blow it all. I mean, it's still there. He just buried it. He wanted to protect it. So it would be in the same condition. He wanted to preserve it. I mean, how bad is that? What's so wrong with that? You might ask. One of my best college friends is from Virginia in when we were in school, he had a family emergency, and he lived six hours away, and he, it would be a six-hour drive there and a six-hour back. But the problem was his vehicle needed repair. It was good enough to get around town, whatever, but he was worried that it might not make the whole trip there and back. So I let him borrow my car. I think it's fair to say that I entrusted my vehicle to my friend so he could make this trip. Now, you're going to say, oh, David, you're such a good friend. Hang on. I wasn't without transportation. I got to drive his vehicle, which was a Jeep Wrangler five-speed with no windows or doors. If he drove a Prius, I would have said, here's a bus ticket. Good luck. <laughs> but I got to drive his Jeep. And a few days later, when he came back to school with my car, I almost didn't recognize it. I double took, like, what? It was, it was shining. It was scintillating. I, I opened the door. It was vacuumed. There was an air freshener. It looked better than when I bought it. I couldn't believe that, that, that it was like that. The gas tank totally full. I said, hey, man, are things settled down at home or did you need my car again this weekend? Because we, we could work that out. I entrusted him with something that was pretty important, pretty valuable to me, and he brought it back way better than I could have imagined. And now, I mean, I would entrust anything to this friend, way more than even a vehicle. As uh, politically divided as we are, as a country these days, there's actually one area where it seems like we have historically been able to see sides work together. This is a topic that's not perfect, don't get me wrong, but unlike any other issue, we have seen Republicans and Democrats actually work together on this issue, and the issue is conservation. Conservation. Things, no matter who you are or what you believe, you can get behind. Things like Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, national parks. I didn't say climate, I said conservation. We've got some hope, we've got some unity here. If you look back, it took both, it took everybody coming together for these things to pass. And I think conservationalist Doug Duran explained it best. I absolutely love this quote he says about conservation. He says, it's not ours, it's just our turn. Talking about our planet, our resources, it's not ours. It's just our turn. This is exactly the attitude that we should have for conserving this planet that we've been entrusted, but it's also the attitude we should take toward the things that God has entrusted us personally in our own lives. It's not ours. It's just our turn. It's under our watch and care. 
the servants knew that they'd have to give the gold back. They knew it wasn't theirs. They knew they didn't own it. They were temporary blessings entrusted to them for a short time. The, the first two, they understood it. The five bags became 10. The two bags became four. They maximized this blessing so that when the master returned, he could see their gratitude. It was just so evident from what they did with it, that they leveraged it, that they made it more. It was unmistakable how thankful they were for this temporary blessing. But what was the difference with the third one? The servant with one bag of gold. Why did he do nothing with it? Well, we have to take a look back at verse 24 and 25 that we read to really uncover. It says, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. He said, master, I knew that you are a hard man. The Greek word is sleros. It means, it means a harsh. It means stern or hardened. Harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. Where did he get that? So I was afraid and it went out and hid your gold in the ground. The servant thought something about his master that, that wasn't true. I mean, we just read that he gave just the right amount for each servant. Um, Bible scholar G.H. Lang, when he talks about this part in the verse, he said, God doesn't attempt to fit a lake into a bucket. <laughs> And I'm thankful God doesn't because a lot of days I just feel like a bucket. But every single servant had different amounts according to what they were capable of through God. For some reason, and we don't know why, the third servant was walking around with this idea in his head of some unjust, unreasonable, slave-driving master. And it paralyzed him into idle mode. It made him just do nothing. And verse 25 says he was so afraid that he just hid it. The servant with one bag was just so scared, terrified of what might happen. He just did nothing. He was worried about the what ifs. He got caught up in that and it lulled him into complacency. What if I lose money? What if people judge me? What if it takes too long? What if it's too hard? What if I get sick? What if I get injured? What if, what if, what if? A lot of times the easiest thing to do is just do nothing. Just do nothing with this treasure entrusted to me. Just bury it. Just hide it so it stays the same. C.S. Lewis uh, wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters. Lewis has written a ton of books, but this is the book that he looks back at and says, I have the most difficult time with this one. He says it really messed with his brain while he was writing it because in The Screwtape Letters, it's a book in which Lewis imagines what it would be like to be a demon working for Satan. The perspective from which this book is written, the deceiver is trying to influence humans to turn away from God, to lure them away from God. That's how the book reads. And when you hear the premise of the book, you might think, oh, oh, okay, so demons are trying to bring people away from God. I know what they'll do. I know what they'll do. They'll just get them maybe hooked on drugs. They will exploit their vices. They will coax them into a life of crime. They'll do stuff like that to pull them away from God. That's what I thought that the book would be about. But that's not at all the strategy that the demons use in this book, Screwtape Letters, to bring people away from God. In fact, I want to show you a little excerpt. This is the number one way. He says this is the greatest way to bring your human away from God and, and, and not let him um, live out his life in faith. It says this, the great thing is to prevent his doing anything. As long as he does not convert it into action, it does not matter how much he thinks about this new repentance or about his faith or about God. Let him do anything but act. No amount of piety in his imagination and his affections will harm us if we can just keep it out of his will. As long as the man just never lets, lets it move out from here. As long as it stays here and doesn't go out everything will be just fine. As long as he doesn't leverage all this gold that God has entrusted to him, as long as he just thinks and feels it and doesn't ever move in faith, the demon here in this book is saying, that's fine. No worries. He's doing exactly what we want. That's a haunting thought, isn't it? That's a chilling realization from, you know, a, a fictional book. In this series, we keep talking about impending devastation, impending devastation, that thing we're trying to avoid, that oncoming danger in rumble strips, that, that's what we're talking about. What do we want to avoid at all costs? And the more we dig into it, this is the question that keeps coming to my mind that I want to share with you about this. What if the biggest danger in your life is your hesitancy to maximize it? What if the biggest danger in your life is your hesitancy to maximize your life? What if the greatest threat to your life it's just your resistance to pour it out to the one who's entrusted it to you. Some of you have been following along in this series, 
of rumble strips and you've been rightly thinking like, yeah, I'm probably never going to go to jail. Like I'm looking at the history of my life, the trajectory I'm living. I probably won't, you know, waste my life in, in some criminal activity. I'm, I'm probably not going to give in to self-destructive habits and get hooked on drugs. Maybe you're thinking that, and I just want to say, maybe you're right. Maybe you are. But what I'm trying to show you is this right here. What if the biggest danger to your life, the thing you actually want to avoid the most, is your hesitancy to maximize it? You may not end up swerving into a ditch. I'll give you that. Maybe not. But how could it be any less horrific to actually end up at the end of your journey, to make it to your destination, only to be met with this? You were so lazy. You were so lazy. I entrusted so much to you, and what did you do? Nothing. I, was, I overflowed your cup, and what did you do? You hid it. To me, that's even more horrific. Just a moment ago, I mentioned some, <laughs> I mentioned some bad books. Uh, are there any garbage shows that you like to watch? If you're, if you're not going to admit it, just know, we know you watch some garbage TV. You just don't want to admit it. Everyone does. I'm not talking about inappropriate stuff. I mean just bad television. Just things that you watch it and you're like, this is extremely fake. This is extremely scripted. We all have those guilty pre- pleasures. So I'm gonna, I want to admit to you that I went through a rough season in my life where I was watching people dig for gold. <laughs> there are... Maybe some of you, okay, it's all right. You'll come find me later when people aren't around. Hey, I watched it too. (laughs) There are more shows about people looking for gold than there are people who've actually found gold, okay? How can you build an entire 12-episode series on nothing? I don't know, but I'm going to tune in. (laughs) Anyway, I want to redeem myself for the time that I wasted watching gold digger shows, and I want to help you. I'm going to help you here identify the gold in your life. In the past series, in some series in the past, we've talked about some of this stuff. I want you to know where your bags of gold are. We have broken this down into seven arenas. In some arenas, you may have five bags. In some arenas, you may have two bags and some just one. But in every arena of your life, you've got some amount of gold that God has entrusted to you. So check this out. Seven arenas of your life. The first, physical. I mean, your overall bodily health your fitness, mental, your cognitive capacity, as well as your mental health, family. And that can look a lot of ways in 2022, but your family, social, the people that you choose to spend your time with and the people that choose to spend their time with you, your community, financial. This is the next arena, your assets, your capital, what you do with them, vocational. This is your your job, your career, or your volunteering, or the the time that you use in your life toward productivity. If you're retired or between jobs, skills you've acquired there. And finally, spiritual. The spiritual arena, your relationship with God, your access to your creator. I was in a a men's group last year. Uh, We spent seven weeks, and we just one week per arena that we talked about. I know there's some ladies who did this too. And we had a couple goals with this. Number one was just realizing, just letting it sink in how blessed we were, how much had been entrusted to us in each one of these, pointing out all the gold. And that's the thing. Even in what you would call your weakest arena, you're looking at this like, oh, I'm, I don't have much there. Yes, you have been entrusted gold there. You might say, well, my physical health isn't what it used to be. But you're here. You woke up this morning. You got out of bed. You can speak with your voice. Your heart's beaten, and you did nothing to make that happen. You are physically capable of a lot more than you think. You're rich in that area, bag of gold. Or maybe you're like, ah, vocational. I don't like my job. I'm unemployed or what? It's something like that. Well, you have some kind of income. You are contributing to society. You're providing some kind of service. Or if you're unemployed or retired, hey, your past experience stays with you. You've built up some skills and some ability. Vocationally, I want to tell you, you're richer than you think you are. And the next thing we did in our groups was we discussed, how do we leverage this gold? How do we maximize it? How do we multiply it? What has been entrusted to us? Listen, you've been entrusted with a lot of gold. In your family, say your family, for instance, and you sarcastically say, yeah, I got gold in my family, fool's gold. (laughs) My family is some real gems. Uh, God entrusted these fools to you, though. He did. That's your family. And and you have the ability to influence them. How can you multiply something in them? Because God entrusted them to you, and you can have an impact with them spiritually. If you've been entrusted with this gift, it's your, your faith has grown a lot recently. How are you going deeper? 
Are you just sitting back and hiding it? Are you comfortable right now? Or are you multiplying it, making even more out of it, replicating it in somebody else with that arena, with that gold? If you want to look at these longer, they're in the app, but uh, I know that if, if it's going through your mind right now, like I don't have a lot of gold or where, where is my gold? You need to look at this. God has entrusted more gold in your life than you would think. And my question is, which arena do you think that you have the most gold? When you look at this, how has God richly blessed you the most? One of these, let's do this right now. Think about this. If you had to pick one, what is it in your mind? Now you've got that in your mind. And now I want to ask you, are you satisfied with how you've used it? Are you satisfied with it? When the master returns to his servant and he says, let's settle accounts, what are you going to be able to say? You know, you just admitted you've been richly blessed in this area, that a lot has been entrusted to you. Now, are you maximizing it to the highest potential? Or is this maybe a difficult realization this morning that you've been sitting back, that you've been asleep at the wheel, that you've been a little passive with all this that's been entrusted to you? This is not meant to attack. I, I want to turn your eyes open to just how richly you've been blessed. This is your list of gold. God has richly entrusted this to you. Let's wake up. It's time to wake up and get to work. As I was preparing for this message this week, Rick, our executive minister, stopped by my office. He laid this on my desk Wednesday, and he said, hey, take a look at this. This picture, you can see it here on the screen. I was amazed. This was the coolest thing I saw this week. This is old photograph. It's 97 years old. It was taken in the year 1925. This group of people... They called themselves West Park Church, located on Addison Road in Indianapolis, Indiana. Today, it's known as Victory in the City. When I look, yeah. When I look at this photo, I see hundreds of people. I see men and women of all different ages, from the tiniest baby being held in its mother's arms to the old men who are standing guard in the back. The toddlers and the little kids are all dressed up. Their parents got them ready for this picture day in 1925. I see grandmas, I see grandpas, I see husbands and wives, aunts and uncles, single, widow. I see salespeople, I see medical professionals, I see stay-at-home moms, teachers. I see game changers in this photo. People who've been a part of the church probably for years and years, and without a doubt, people who are brand new, to this church in Indianapolis. Imagine all the stories of life change. Imagine the stories that these folks would have to tell. It'd be amazing. When I look at this photograph, you know what I see? I see us. I see us, every one of us here, with our hopes and dreams for our church, for our life. I see us when I look at this photograph. And I can't help but think about West Park and about victory. What if we just did nothing? What if we just sat idly by? That would have been the easy thing to do, right? Just, no, that's not for us. When we were approached by the opportunity, we just said, no, it's too far away. It'll cost too much money. It'll never work. We could have done that. But Jesus said in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is required. To whom much has been entrusted, much more will be expected in victory. How much has been entrusted to us? Who's been blessed more than us? Someday there will be a hundred-year-old photo of us. Someday. It'll say Victory Christian Church. Franklin, Indianapolis, Victory Everywhere. A hundred-year-old photo of us. And it'll be in some other person's hands because you and I won't be here anymore. And I hope someone will take a look at this old picture of us. Take a look at this church and they'll see a church that was richly blessed that was swimming in bags of gold and that chose to multiply them, to replicate them, to maximize the things that have been entrusted to us. Most of all, though, I hope when someone's holding our photo 100 years from now, that we will be able to say from our master at the end of our journey that he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been entrusted with a few things. I'm gonna entrust you with many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I hope this message, I hope this series was a rumble strip in your life. 
I hope you heard something and you felt something and it woke you up and it snapped you back into it. I hope it made you alert. I hope it caused you to see just how ridiculously wealthy you are. But seeing it and feeling it isn't enough. It's not enough. It doesn't move into kingdom gain, then it's, it's, it doesn't amount to anything. The enemy would love to see us just do nothing. Just sit back and hide it. That would be great for the enemy. I, I hope you see that your life is full of gold. But it's not too much and it's not too little. It's the perfect amount tailor-made for you because your master knows exactly the perfect amount for you. So our question is, when the, our master returns, when we have to settle up and give report for all that's been entrusted to us, will we be able to say, I poured it all out. I maximized it. I, I hope and pray that we will. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the, this opportunity we have every week to worship. God, thank you for every person who's with us today, online, in person, Lord, for the songs that we sing, to give you all the praise, Lord. I thank you for this series, how you've moved in it, how you've moved in us. Lord, I pray for the conviction, for our eyes to open, just to see how richly you've blessed us, all the things you've entrusted to us. Lord, our cup overflows. And I ask God that you inspire us as we move forward to wake up, put these rumble strips on our journey so that we can get back on course, so that we avoid the danger of letting our life go by and just hiding it and burying it, Lord. Let us be a church that answers the call, that pours it all out, that doubles our bags of gold, and then doubles them again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, talking about moving and, and using your life, leveraging it for the kingdom, uh, we would love to talk to you about next steps. You can do that in so many ways here. We'll be at the next steps room. Or you can text the word next to 317-576-2288. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Victory. We don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. Have a wonderful week.